Harvard Divinity School. When Politics Are Sacralized, Comparative Perspectives on Religious Claims and Nationalism, September 28th, 2021. We'll just do a brief introduction here and I'll introduce our, uh, our moderator who will introduce our speakers today. But we're um, so happy today to welcome you all to our Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative webinar. Today, we're proud to be celebrating the publication of when Politics Are Sacralized, Comparative Perspectives on Religious Claims and Nationalism, with the co-authors, as well as a few authors of the book. My name is Hilary Rantisi, and I'm the Associate Director of the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, a program of religion and public life at Harvard Divinity School. Our work centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence, and power, and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can bring fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for just peace building. Our main case study in our work is focusing on Israel-Palestine. And um, so we will have lots of events during the semester. And I just wanted to give you a, just a, a, a brief introduction to some of our work. And I'll, an invitation also for you to be uh, be part of it in whichever uh, format you're at, whether you're a student or a member of the general public or a faculty member. So in addition to our public events, we, um, we have offerings for Harvard students across uh, the various graduate schools at Harvard, and we provide um, uh, courses classroom courses, experiential learning, and practical experiences with internships in the region, one that builds upon the other. We also have programming for with Harvard faculty and PhD students and a robust faculty uh, fellowship program that hosts a diverse group of thought and practice leaders in areas of peace building and cultural activism, specifically in Israel-Palestine. The themes of our uh, seminars um, this semester are for this particular um, um, event today will be on religious terminologies and secular nationalism and political violence. But we also have future events that will focus on uh, themes of decolonial sites of practice and theory in Israel, Palestine and political emancipatory theologies from a comparative perspectives. We hope you'll be joining for those as well. And um, so now without further ado, I'd like to um, hand off to my colleague, Atalia Omer, who will introduce herself and will also introduce our panelists and some framing. So welcome everyone. Hello, thank you, Hilary, and welcome everyone. Um, so uh, yes, greetings. Uh, my name is Atalia Omer. I'm a professor of religion, conflict, and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, which is a part of the Keough School of Global Affairs, both at the University of Notre Dame in the US. I'm also the Dermot T.J. Dumphy Visiting Professor of Religion, Violence, and Peace Building at Harvard, Harvard Divinity School's Religion and Public Life Program. And it is in this capacity that I work closely uh, with the wonderful colleagues with Hilary Rantisi, uh, Rima Tassi, Professor Diane Moore um, on uh, the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative, which hosts this event. So let us now proceed. But before we do, I wanted to acknowledge my presence here in South Bend, Indiana, on the traditional homelands of native peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, Miami, Peoria, and particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. So as Hillary mentioned, the occasion for this panel is the recent publication by Cambridge University Press of the co-edited volume titled When Politics Are Sacralized, Comparative Perspectives on Religious Claims and Nationalism. It is co-edited by professors Nadim Ruhana and Nadira Shalhub Kevorkian and features features leading thinkers who examine the broad sets of questions the discussion of religious claims and nationalism generates with a particular attention dedicated to the concept of fusion of religion and political claims and how they authorize state violence. The title suggests a comparative angle 
but the majority of the chapters in this volume is focused on Palestine Israel with an understanding of the instructive dimensions of the case and its global and international resonances for the study of religion and public life and political modernity broadly. I find the book as a whole especially compelling because the various chapters and framing unfold through an interrogation of Western Christian modernity's relevance for the discussion of contemporary forms of sacralized politics within and through nationalist frameworks and idioms. The authors draw substantively on the academic study of religion as itself a comparative anthropological category embodied and embedded in a colonial discourse. Often scholarship on religion and politics reverts to unreconstructed accounts and assumptions pertaining to the categories of analysis under consideration, namely the religious versus the secular as if they were binaries and as if the secular meant the absence of religious cultural content rather than a space constituted by theopolitical imagination and discursive forces, power. This volume departs from this, from, from this tendency, this inclination by centralizing a critique of Western Christian modernity, exposing at the very least the conceptual limits of its operative categories of analysis deployed in efforts to understand religions, public and political roles and meanings. What is often under theorized, as I mentioned, is the relation of religion to political ideology, national historiographies, and a spectrum of forms of violence, including epistemic, namely pertaining to the question of knowledge production and assumptions about political and other forms of normativity. The authors we invited to share their reflections with us today interrogate and um, interrogate in, in different ways how religious claims undergird and obscure settler colonial realities and why and how religious and political claims are fused to produce and entrench state violence and specifically the realities of Jewish supremacy that define the geopolitical space of Palestine Israel. We also hope to look at how religion is mobilized as a political emancipatory idiom locked in a dialectic tension with sacralized political, cultural, symbolic, and epistemic modes of violence. Along with thinking about emancipatory potentials, the relations between biblical and secular colonial grammars are of a particular interest for us at the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. And our focus on expanding the analysis of religion and structural, cultural, and epistemic forms of violence in order to think more capaciously and creatively about what religion has to do potentially with imagining decolonial horizons. So this book offers a generative occasion to deepen this line of analysis. Let me now very briefly introduce the esteemed panelist. My colleague Rima Tassi will paste in the chat their more ex um, um, extensive bios. Our first speaker is, uh, is one of the co-editors, is Professor Nadim Ruhana, who is a professor of international affairs and conflict studies and director of the Forest Center for Eastern Mediterranean Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Second, we will hear from, what, from one of the contributors, Professor Amnon Raz Krakotskin, who will discuss the thesis of his chapter, his contribution, and the structure of his argument, and how it relates to the broader motifs and conceptual queries of the book. Professor Raz Krakotskin te teaches is a professor of early modern and modern Jewish history in the Department of Jewish History at Ben Gurion University. <clears throat> After Professor Raz Krakotskin, we will hear from Professor Khaled al hub who will similarly reflect on his contribution and how it relates to the editorial framing. Professor al hub is a professor of Middle Eastern Studies and Ar Arab Media Studies at Northwestern University in Qatar. And finally, we will hear from uh, the second co-editor and contributor herself, Professor uh, Nadira Shalhub Kevorkian, who is a prof uh, Professor Shalhub Kevorkian, is a Palestinian feminist uh, scholar activist. She is the Lawrence D. Bill Chair in Law at the University of 
Law Institute of Criminology and the School of Social Work and Public Welfare at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And she is also the Global Chair in Law in Queen Mary University of London. I encourage the viewers and listeners to look up these amazing scholars who are extremely prolific and learn more about their respective scholarship. So uh, with this, I will turn to you, Professor Ruhana, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I do want to thank uh, uh, Hilary Rantisi and Natalia Omer for organizing this panel uh, on our book. And uh, I want to uh, thank my colleagues for presenting their work too. Uh, I want to do three things in this uh, presentation. One, briefly talk about the book. Second, uh, what do we mean by sacralized politics and what is the new in what we are presenting? And, and then the modalities of how sacralized politics work. Uh, Nadira will refer to that in her talk. And then I'll take two main points from my own contribution uh, about uh, how religious legitimation is obscuring settler colonialism in the case of Zionism. So with the first, with the first point, our initial interest in this project emerged from our research and personal involvement. Both of us are Palestinians, citizens of Israel, grew up there under Zionist hegemony. And so our personal involvement in the dynamics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and our observation of its historical evolution. Uh, so each of us experienced both academically, personally, and so on. And we couldn't avoid looking at how Zionism is legitimizing itself and how is it that the world is not seeing that it's a settler colonial project. We came to this project not as scholars of religion and nationalism per se, but more as involved scholars of a conflict in which the intertwining between religious claims and nationalism are transforming its dynamics the main or a mainstream, a mainstream discourse on the conflict is that it's religious. As you know, this is not new. The publics in both Israel and Palestine do not see it as a religious conflict. And th that's the majority of Israelis and Palestinians. They see it either settler colonial, national, uh, or on the Israeli side as a conflict of liberating the land of Israel from basically its natives, right? So yet in the past decade or so, but past decades, there is, a, 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 there is clear invocation of uh, religious claims. And the role of religion is there in the conflict, not necessarily in thinking about it as a religious conflict. So the project that we, we did is based on number of, it's based on a generous, uh, uh, support by the Henry Luce Foundation. We should say that they supported numerous meetings and many discussions and many seminars. And the cases in addition to the Israel and Palestine included India, Iran, Northern Ireland, not necessarily as a case of fusion of religion and nationalism. And Palestine, again, not necessarily as such with um, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia, Serbia, and Sri Lanka. Now, let's see what do we mean by sacralization. First, let's notice that scholarly discussions on the relationship between religion and nationalism and the emergence of secularization paradigm and its critique have been exhaustive. And as Atalia mentioned, the views that divorce nationalism from religion reject the possibility that religious elements are integrated in nationalism or that consider nationalism as modernity's total replacement of religion have long been challenged in the literature on religion and nationalism. And all our authors basically uh, take this view. We share the argument that has been broadly accepted in post-colonial literature that secularists and Eurocentric biases have shaped the view that nationalism replaced religion 
and became distinctive category, uh, as also highlighted by some contributors, as I said. Yet, at the same time, we come from, we look at it with a different angle. While we accept this view, we also concur with some scholars, Brubacher in particular, that there remains the case that the fundamental, I'm quoting, the fundamental point of reference of nationalist politics is the nation, right? And end of quote, and the political, and that political claims are made in the name of the nation and its distinctive doctrine of sources of legitimacy and political authority. So our focus here, and this is part of what we are doing, is the state, is the political legitimacy of the state and its modalities of action vis-a-vis -vis others. What stands at the center at the, at the center of our inquiry is the impact of the intertwining, particularly when religious claims and nationalism are fused to the extent that relig religious claims bestow sacredness on the state's working of power and the modalities of its operation. What counts as religious, the question is, again, using one of our colleagues, Wubacher, what counts as religious message and imagery as opposed to religiously tinged or originally religious, but subsequently secularized language and imagery? This is imaginary. This is very important because in the literature, you find that, okay, there are many states that uh, uh, in which the interaction between religion and nationalism is high and so on. Our answer to this, what counts as fusion is when religion and religious claims interact in nationalism in ways that are used to publicly frame and or legitimize the state's political ideologies. I want to see my colleagues who tell me it's the case the case of Israel and India is all over. I want them to point out where the state, like in the United States, where does the state use religion to legitimize its policies vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis its population and groups and so on. So this is why in our, our view, when it comes to the impact of religious claims on state politics, lumping all cases of nationalism together by arguing that all nationalisms have religious influence, yes, but it's not the same religious influence, right? This is this is a major a major claim uh, that we uh, that we make. Our analysis seeks to examine how, through hegemonic nationalism, states invoke religious the religious claims as being foundational for politics. So this sacralization, and I'll talk a bit about what do we mean by sac sacralization bestows sacredness in the religious sense on the state policy and state politics. So what we you see, and here we really invert what we mean by sacralized politics. Sacralized politics in the literature all over is that some political and national behavior, symbols, idioms, manifestations are given Relig the, the status of sacredness, like in religion, borrowing the terms from religion, but it's not religion. What we do is that we inverse it and we say it's when the state used the sacred text and sacred, sacred argumentation to legitimize and to explain its policies. So this is this is the new perspective that we do. So we hear it, we really hear our intervention revert to the original meaning of uh, uh, religious sacralization and investigates how religious claims confer sacredness in this uh, original original sense. Okay, I know I am I have very uh, uh, precious precious couple of minutes. I'll put two points from my argument. I notice that, the, uh, the religious legitimation in the question of religion in Israel and leg legitimation is increasing. 
And I want to, to give you two, two main points. The religious legitimation, the increasing religious legitimation for the whole Zionist project, all of it, starting uh, in, the, in the 19th century until its manifestations now, the religious legitimation is obscuring the nature of the project as a settler colonial project. And the religious national support for the settlement is unquestionable, that's true. But it, it, has, it has forceful roots in the openly religious Zionist discourse. I argue that the direct or indirect blaming of religious nationalism or religious parties for what's happening is really avoiding responsibility. Their responsibility is not or is not solely that of religious nationalism and what the religious nationalism is doing. <laughs> the, the, the responsibility is the responsibility of the project itself as settler colonial. And actually now they need the legitimation. I'll tell you why in a minute, they need the legitimation of the religious. I want to, uh, a point I make in the chapter, I don't have time to expand it, is imagine that the project of Zionism was implemented in Uganda, right? What would happen to the Zionists in Uganda in terms of legitimation? There will be, there will be resisted, there will be resistance as the president of Uganda actually told Netanyahu when he, <laughs> when he visited Uganda, I'm happy you didn't come to Uganda. We would be uh, fighting you. But they can't resort to religious legitimation. It will become a similar case like South Africa, let's say. In Palestine, it's the, they need their religious legitimation, and this is why it's increasing. The second point and last point, and I'll, I'll end here, is that we, you know, we talk about settler colonial uh, literature, and it's fantastic. And we go to the uh, 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 to to the main themes that you know, uh, settler colonialism is a structure, and it's an invasion, and so fantastic, clear. But there is one point that is neglected, and that is the natives' resistance, Palestinian resistance. And I think the more the Palestinians resist the project, the more the project needs legitimation. How would you legitimize the need for a Jewish state when your citizens, 25% of them are not Jewish, right? And that legitimacy has not been given to the, to the project by Palestinians. And the more resistance there is ideologically, thematically, physically, and so on, the more the need to go to their religious legitimation. I end here and I hope, Atalia, that I abided by the time. Oh, more yeah, questions. yeah, you were you were wonderful. I just want to, um, uh, just to make sure that, um, I mean, I'm assuming that most of our, uh, the people in the audience would know uh, the reference to Uganda. So, uh, but in case you don't, Uganda was on the table in 1903, right? <laughs> um, as a proposal for the possible um, destination uh, for the, um, for the Jewish Zionist project, and it uh, it it, uh, it wasn't successful because it had to be that particular um, space Zion um, as the kind of the, the destination. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I really um, uh, just to, um, um, to to underscore uh, a few of the of the key points that Professor Wuhana made. Um, one about uh, the understanding of um, kind of the focus of the of, of the book on that. Um, concept of sacralization, it's when religious discourse, religious idioms and justification used explicitly to, um, to authorize uh, policies. So this is important kind of conceptual uh, uh, frame. Um, and then um, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I uh, will turn to you, uh, Professor Raz Krakowskin, um, to discuss your chapter and your argument. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure that I will simply discuss my, uh, uh, my chapter here, but first I want to thank uh, both the, the, the organizers of this evening and particularly uh, Nadim and, and Nadira for having the privilege to, to be part of this amazing project and for the wonderful work with them. 
And I had the opportunity to read the entire book during the last days and to see how rich it is. And indeed the focus, yeah, it emphasis, the emphasis is Zionism and the question of Palestine, but it's a really a great opportunity to see what is exceptional here and what is not. Because only when you see what is not exceptional and can be found in different places, you can also, you can discuss, uh, uh, you can discuss what is unique here and perhaps uh, learn from, from that, how, which kind of strategies we can uh, use in order to secularize or in fact to decolonize. Because after all, the discussion here is not about religion. The discussion here, as Nadine said, is about the state and the colonial state. We are talking about colonialism, not religion. We think about, so when we think about decolonization, this is the question. And for that, the first question is indeed when we talk religion, the religious claims and nationalism is what is religion? What is religious? And with, when we talk about Zionism, as I will try to show, this is indeed difficult. Yes, what is the non-religious? What it would be considered as secular? Do we have secular colonialism versus non-secular? Or the secular myth itself is embedded within a theological framework of legitimation, because I refer to what Nadine just said. Uh, what is the model according to which we analyze, evaluate religion, uh, the, the state uh, uh, of, of religion, when the state does not use? This is uh, the question that we have to think, to say, and uh, Atalia Omer uh, contributed to it in a very interesting analysis, comparative analysis. And indeed, if I, understand, if I think that you will agree with me, the distinction is not so clear. Definitely not in terms of violence. I mean, states with re religious uh, uh, ethnic cleansing is not more violent than secular ethnic cleansing, so the differences are really a question. And the question of sacralization raised while reading another question, because we are talking about sacralization of politics, but of also we're talking about racialization of the sacred. The book is also about this. It's not simply religion. You can't deal with religion separately. It's the racialization of religion. It's the way religion is used in these four other aspects. Because I thought uh, we can, can, what does it mean, uh, sacred politics? Should we totally abandon the notion of the sacred? I mean, the secular division is between secular and religious. The sacred is something else. I really thought about uh, uh, about the struggle of against oppression. Is sacred, and for me it's important to say because I'm talking after all about the colonial regime in Palestine from the point of view of someone who belongs to the colonizers and wish to use a method of sacredness something that is beyond ourselves in order to generate a counter narrative to what I will, uh, I will just uh, say a few words now. Now, in my article, I use the pro this problem while thinking about the two aspects in which you should deal the secular and the religious from a Jewish point of view. The first, Jews as a problem to the secular order to the European secular order, to the division, religion versus nations, when, they, when the Jews are asked whether they are religion or a nation, this is when the distinction between these two terms is defined. This is, the way, this is how it is defined, and they, did, they didn't know. And the second is Zionism as a project of allegedly secularization of the Jews. But actually the secular is 
decolonization is part, is meaning part, being, the Jews being part of the West, part of such an, a, a, a historical, a, a, such of the historical myth. And it, it, I think that in Israel, this very distinction, uh, religious versus secular, is misleading, is really problematic. Because secular is not secular. The secular is, a, is, is exclusively Jewish. It is, so it has its, its, its meaning. It's a national definition. It's not a secular definition. It's crucial to understand it in order to think about secularization, which means here not something that immediately say something about religion, but a perspective that includes Jews, Israeli Jews and Palestinian. Otherwise, the talk is the discussion about secular or secular Israel is meaningless, particularly when the myth, the Zionist myth is absolutely embedded within the theological, not necessarily within Jewish previous messianic attitudes. In fact, its nationalization means its accommodation to a previously Christian myth of the return of the Jews to their homelands. That's why it is legitimized, I think, Nadine. From the beginning, it was clear from the Balfour Declaration to Balfour, it was clear that this he is suggesting a settler colonial entity in Palestine for the Jews and only for the Jews. Without, with total denial of uh, Palestinian uh, nationalism. Basically, the, the so Zionism is the return of the Jews to their homeland, considered as empty, the return to the, the restoration of the biblical entity, with total identification with Joshua and the, and the ancient conquest of Palestine and the destruction of its people. It is there. It doesn't mean that all Zionists exactly so it, it, it in this way, and there were many observations and objections even, but if you think about the myth on me, of Israel, this is the myth, and there are many other aspects on which I will not, which I discuss in my paper, and I will not uh, 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 deal with one. The Bible is not exceptional for Zionism. The Bible was the core of national identities in Europe. So the very discussion of secular and nationalism as secular is problematic. The, the, you can think about any settler colonial enterprise, which is not based on this story. And the exception is that in Zionism, it, it is directed to this story with the total denial of any other history with the total, uh, 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 of any other history and existence of the land, including, by the way, previous Jewish communities, uh, which I suggest in my, briefly in my article, that they may propose, through thinking about them, we may propose a counter-colonial discourse, not as secular, not against religion, but within religion. Because for the moment, both Nadim and, 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 and Nadira, uh, the essay, deal indeed with religious Zionists. The manifestation of nationalism is today uh, is, is definitely with a religious a, 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 a dominance. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that we can distinguish the non uh, the non-religious. They do not participate perhaps in these direct activities, these messianic activities but they do not propose an alternative narrative. Their narrative is still the narrative, secular narrative is of the Western community. I think I have no time. I can understand from... Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we, 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 we I mean, do you have, uh, do you want to un continue to unpack the, um, your, your chapter or we can return to uh, some of the points later? 
No, I think that, I mean, it is impossible, yes. That, that, uh, well, my, my, my main argument is to see both Zionism as exception, but within, but you, that you cannot be understood simply as a, 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 a something that I, to discuss isolated from its origins in the Christian West as, a, as part of the construction of this new Judeo-Christian a, a, a entity within it. That's why it is distinguished from other a, a projects of, of colonialism. And I also propose the notion of exile that is denied in Zionist uh, discourse, but, it, but is the core of the Jewish religious identity as a notion through which we can question not only the Zionist state, but the entire logic of the nation of the nation state. So, so Zionism is perhaps exception, but it is exceptional and, and, and particularly this exception leads to this permanent dispossession, permanent oppression, permanent. Yes, the dispossession is continuous. It's not something that happened that you want to self It's something that we want to stop once, first of all. A permanent dispossession, but at the same time, it provides the, the, the alternative is not to accept the notion of, of the secular uncritically, because we all know that it is difficult to distinguish secular from colonialism, from racism, but to think through the idea of binationalism, which is the only way to formulate secular reality now uh, about different modes of uh, different ways of thinking. So I stop here because I I don't think. Okay, uh, uh, thank you so much. There is so much, so rich and there is so much to unpack and I would like um, uh, after we um, um, finish with this first round to return to um, um, to dig deeper into some of the points, especially with respect to, uh, to what you just articulate, articulated in reference to exile. Um, as um, kind of a source for uh, decoloniality um, and um, something that is core uh, a, uh, at the core of Jewishness. Um, so uh, I just want to um, to briefly highlight uh, a few points of connections before we turn to the third speaker. Also, because there was a request uh, for a member in the audience to um, um, to kind of briefly summarize, which is impossible. Um, but um, uh, but I'll just want to highlight uh, two points. Uh, Professor Wuhana uh, talked in reference to his chapter about how um, religion participates <clears throat> in ever intensifying ways in obscuring the, the, the actual realities, uh, the settler colonial realities um, uh, that are unfolding and deepening and are entrenched uh, on the ground. Um, and um, Professor Ralph Krakowski also, you took us deeper into uh, what kind of a project it is, that it's uh, a colonial Christian Western uh, project that also is embedded within a, um, a Christian political theological imagination. And it's something that uh, about the return of the Jews and the restoration and, and so forth, um, that of course it relied on the mechanisms um, and the logic of settler colonialism. And so those grammars and discourses are converging and, in, uh, and intensify one another. And so, um, um, so, so these are some uh, important uh, points, uh, kind of takeaway points to, to, to highlight, in addition to the concept of the secular, kind of a complex understanding of the sec secular and more meaningful uh, conception of the secular that is uh, also a site of, uh, for decolonial um, imagination um, of the relationships of identity to, uh, to the space, since we're, we are talking about a particular space. So with that, I'll turn to uh, Professor Hub. Um, to take us through kind of your argument and your chapter and how it relates to the broader framing of the book. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the organizing the event uh, and having all of us. Um, well, in my chapter, um, I kind of focus on uh, the Palestinian national movement. So uh, I take the notion and the concept of uh, sacred politics and try to apply it on the, on the Palestinian nationalism and then examine to what degree um, religious claims and religion have been used, exploited, or maybe the lack of the whole practice. 
my my argument and conclusion in the chapter runs maybe against the main thrust of the book, uh, saying uh, when we uh, deconstruct the discourses, the practices, the politics of the Palestinian national movement, um, the conclusion goes maybe against the conventional wisdom that if you think of the Palestinians, especially nowadays with the rise of Islamism in Palestine, Hamas, the Islamic Jihad and others, um, the thinking goes to more Islamized and religious driven, religiously driven uh, politics. Now I uh, break away from the current moment and I, I go back uh, in history, um, maybe over a century of politics and the practice, uh, dividing the Palestinian national movement into three phases, uh, pre-1948, then after 1948, and then after uh, until 1987, that is the emergence of Hamas, uh, the Islamized Palestinian, Palestinian politics, or the model of the Islamized Palestinian politics. Now, I have three points to share with you. Uh, the, the first one is my main argument in, in, in the chapter. And then the second and the third points may be some sort of kind of open, uh, open arguments or open questions that um, they are very much kind of related to the chapter and they are in the chapter, but I would say, I would consider them maybe as work in progress. Now I start by arguing that, you know, the two cases of Zionism and the Palestinian national movement, they differ significantly in terms of the employment of religion in their prospective uh, nationalism. Uh, this difference is based, is based on two grounds, function and centrality. And this is kind of the, this is the crux of the, of my argument. Uh, by function, I mean using religion and religious claims as a primary force to invent or support invading a territory and then... Oh, okay. okay. We lost you there for a second, but go, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Um, now, in the Palestinian case, by contrast, the function of religion was secondary, not a primary, and mostly in my analysis as a mobilization tool of resistance and defensive in nature. So we have this kind of uh, contrast. In, in the case of Zionism, it was uh, the core, the backbone and offensive in nature in the Palestinian uh, context, it was kind of uh, defensive and used in, in resistance and mobilization. Now, that is to do with function. The other difference comes from the centrality of religion in both projects, which is very much kind of related. In Zionism, I argue that religion and religious claims have always been, have, have, uh, have always occupied a central position in the project before, during, and after the creation of the state until this very moment. Now, in the case of the Palestinian nationalism, I argue, and this is through, you know, examining the, the, again, the practices, the literature, the discourses, the statements, and so on and so forth. I argue that the political landscape has always been occupied by national forces and national claims with various shades and, and leanings. But the focus was always on self-determination, the realization of an independent state for all its citizens, secular kind of arguments, all that most of the time. Religion and religious claims have only appeared on the margins throughout you know, a century of the struggle until the emergence of Hamas. Hamas came about um, almost kind of 40 years after even the, the creation of Israel. So we have, we have three phases. I will um, touch upon them now quickly. But even Hamas, even in the case of Hamas, that somehow kind of uh, uh, exemplified the, the, this kind of mingling between politics and religion in the Palestinian uh, scene, Hamas itself moved constantly and steadily since its emergence until now to the national realm, if you like, uh, changing and modifying the discourse, the language, and I use in the chapter two main documents, the charter of Hamas, the original charter that was published in 1988, and the modified charter, uh, charter in 2017. Then I compare them together then to see the journey, the nationalized journey, even within the most Islamized or the most religiously driven Palestinian uh, force. Now, this is my, my first point, And I have kind of to share with you maybe some, some sort of exercise that I've been thinking about. 
when I kind of compare Zionism to the Palestinian national uh, movement. And I, I used in this exercise, this is not in the chapter, by the way, uh, I used in this exercise um, the theory or the notion of the two swords. Um, and I create this kind of some sort of analogy. Maybe it's uh, in, incomplete, incomplete, but I hope it will uh, give us some some maybe kind of extension, some uh, sophistication of the argument or opens up some uh, certain um, areas and the spaces. Now the two swords um, analogy, and this goes back to the 14th century uh, a metaphor with the Pope Boniface the Eighth. Um, he said, we have two swords, the sword of Peter, this is the temporal power and the sword of the church. This is the divine power. And for me, when I thought about these two swords uh, and the whole idea came about in a conflict between the Pope and the French King. And basically the Pope wanted to have the two swords. And he said, we have the sword of Peter is in fact used by Peter to fight for the church. And the sword of the church is used by the church, is used by the church for the church. Now, for me, I thought, you know, maybe in, in the Zionist idea, we have two swords as well. We have the pre-state sword, the sword that was used by Zionism for the church, meaning the Jewish ideal, the Jewish idea of coming back to the Holy Land. And the state sword after the creation of Israel, and this sword is now used by the church, by Israel, the state now, for the church. So we have these two swords, both of them, in fact, are located within the divine sphere. None of them is, in fact, in the hands of the king because the church wanted to control the power of both. Now, when it comes to the Palestinians, was there any sword? Because for me, the whole idea of any mingling with religion and politics in the Palestinian side, it was for the defensive kind of mechanism resistance. There was a Palestinian shield, not a source. So the metaphor that I ended up with like two Jewish swords and one Palestinian shield. And I kind of stress the term Palestinian, meaning you know, the, with its kind of national uh, connotation. This Palestinian shield was somehow materialized in different ideological um, manifestations. Sometimes, you know, pan-Arabist, sometimes, you know, Palestinian thinkers and politicians uh, they aspired for a greater Syria. Uh, some of them, they, they started to focus on Palestine-centered nationalism. Some of them, they embraced Marxism. And the very late generation with Hamas embraced Islamism. So the Palestinian shield, if you like, has taken different coloring. And the religious one came very, very late. And in, in more details, this Palestinian shield, as explained in the chapter, could be seen um, or divided in, 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 in manifestations into three phases. As I said, you know, the, the first phase, which is uh, before the creation of Israel, 1948, I examined dozens of Palestinian parties, institutions, groups, and, and others. Um, I read their kind of constitutions, manifestos, statements, and the, the major one, the overarching thrust in, in the literature and in the discourse was driven by nationalist discourse and politics. Now, after the creation of Israel since 1948, in the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the dominant force was, of course, the PLO with the many factions, and the leading force was um, the Fatah. Within the PLO uh, constellation of Palestinian factions and forces, the national discourse was the dominant. There was no religious force or no religious kind of uh, religiously motivated or driven force until the emergence of Hamas again in 1987. So for in these two phases, religion and re religious claims were in, in the very, very margin. And in the third phase where we have a very strong and influential Islamist and religious, if you like, religious slash nationalist force, that is Hamas. This very movement could not, um, I say, I would say, uh, hold to its kind of purely religious drive because of the internal 
politics and the pressures. And it, it started kind of almost immediately to nationalize itself. And it's a very long process until the declaration of the uh, second uh, charter of Hamas in 2017. So that was my first point. My, se my second and third point, very quick. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe I've taken too much time. But my second point is kind of, again, uh, open a question. Because throughout the decades, the two different, uh, we have been seeing two different trajectories. Uh, one to do with Zionism and another one to do with, um, with the Palestinians. With uh, Zionism, we have been seeing further religionization of the movement. So Zionism started maybe claiming secular slash religious or using religion for pragmatic reasons. But in fact, over time, religion has overtaken the whole idea. The inverse has been happening on the Palestinian um, uh, side. Further nationalization of all ideologies, be, the, be them uh, Marxist, Islamist, uh, Pan-Arabist. So the nationalization curve has been overtaking all other um, uh, ideologies and, and, and forces. This is my second point. And, and again, maybe it's kind of open for uh, de debate. My third and final point is, is, is the following. And this relates to, again, some sort of maybe contemplation and, and, and way of discussion that it, there is a paradox here. Because if you think of uh, the Zionist movement, this comes from within the European experiences uh, driven by intellectuals and thinkers who have molded themselves in line, in line with European, again, uh, perceptions and experiences. So you think this is the modernist movement in, in, in the Middle East. Yet at the core of it, you have all these religious claims and the backbone in fact is, is, is religious, which is in, in, in many ways, this is a pre-modern maybe approach or, or even movement. Now, when it comes, um, because even, and I think Zionism was compelled maybe to do so, to embrace these religious claims, because the two pillars of uh, modern nationalism were lacking at the very beginning, meaning territory plus people, this is one component, and the other component, a unifying language. So if you think of modern nationalism as having th these two underpinning pillars, lacking in your case, you needed an overarching, maybe religious mythology to connect all these kind of people. In the Palestinian case, the two components, modern components of nationalism, territory and its people, one component, and unifying language, they did exist from the very, very beginning. So there was no need for any religious claims to have either connection to the land or to, to say, to have any claim for national identity, there was no nervousness in my view on the Palestinian side in terms of being connected to, to the land. Whereas you have this um, religious mythology remained maybe in the DNA of Zionism from day one until this, uh, until this very moment. Um, and maybe, maybe maybe we should con uh, uh, conclude yeah, now, and, and, and be, because this point is very um, um, uh, co connects really profoundly to what uh, Professor Ras Krokotsin said earlier about we're not talking about religion, we're talking about colonialism uh, and settler yeah, colonialism. I think, I think yeah, I think uh, I will I will just kind of end here um, in these three mom uh, three points, the first one and the yeah. second maybe uh, open ones, and thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. So, so um, thank you for highlighting the um, uh, the distinctions. Since you are talking about um, uh, the, the Palestinian context, the, the, uh, the ways the ways in which you articulated our distinctions in terms of function and um, with respect to religion and distinction in terms of the centrality, the question of the centrality. And here we you also connect with what uh, Professor Ruhana said earlier in kind of the framing that um, that often within kind of these. Um, uh, scholarly and activist conversation that bring in centrally uh, settler colonial discourse like Patrick Wolf's notion of uh, uh, settler colonialism is not an event, it's a structure, it's a process. Um, Professor Wuhana, you really highlighted and it's also in the book um, uh, very centrally that it, what, what it misses when we, we talk about settlers and indigenous natives that uh, what, what what is neglected in the analysis is that concept and practice and space of, of resistance, which then um, uh, generates this dialectics 
uh, where th then we see kind of the disintensification of the religious um, uh, uh, discourse in that dialectical process uh, where, um, and this is reflected in different ways uh, in the context of uh, uh, the Palestinians and the context of uh, uh, Jewish-Israeli uh, discourse. So with that, finally, <laughs> um, uh, Professor uh, Shalub uh, Kavorkian, the stage is yours. Actually, this is a good, a good point to first connect to what you have said before, Italia, which is there is an epistemic violence regarding those different cases. And this epistemic violence is controlled also the intellectual uh, stage. So the, uh, Professor Hrub was talking about resistance to sacralization, whereby in Zionism, it is really in the DNA. So what we are really arguing in our book is that the process of sacralizing politics is not considerably affected by whether religious claims represent sincere commitment emanating from religious convictions or is employed for the purpose of political manipulation. We maintain that the discourse as well as the use of religious claims in politics become constitutive and a defining feature of the political identity and in our case of the, the political identity of the colonial state. So obviously such discourse and its constituted identity enter a mutually reinforcing process. So the performativity, if I use the Butler's analysis of the process itself, in the sense that it turns into a discursive practice that enacts or produces that which it names and creates political reality and promotes discourses that become part of the social consensus. So here really we emphasize in the book the extent to which the discourse gains really an authority to bring about what it names through a different thing. So you, you look at the various chapters that shows that this religious authority can be employed to justify state domination, as in the cases of India and Israel, or to resist domestic domination, Western intervention, as in Iran under the Shah, or defy military occupation. So the sacralized politics as appearing in our book is the practice of appealing to religious claims, religious texts, religious beliefs to justify and legitimize state's policies in any area, explicit or encoded manner, yeah? Regardless of the political actors, religious or secular worldview. And this is why, like what Nono have said in his work, that uh, you know uh, Zionists are secular, but but they needed the Bible to to claim their rights, and that's exactly uh, where we are going. So, in various forms of political encounters with national, religious, or ethnic groups in the same homeland, the sacralization of politics serves to sanction the power of one group and establish not only its exclusive sovereignty but also so it's exclusive political authority and belonging to the homeland. So the sacralization helps and helps us understand the way religious or ethnic affiliation becomes and I become and I really connected to what what uh, we we are emphasizing. It is racialized marker of difference, yeah, and not a signifier of a particular theological interpretation, no, or just cultural difference. It creates a matrix of power within which political life can be lived or articulated through racialized religiously based national or ethnic affiliation. And therefore it constructs discriminatory practices that can constitute an identity of privilege for, for some. So the deployment of racialized discourse of sacredness and its religious distinctions are there to reaffirm the politics of religious exclusivity so sacralized politics, as we argue in the book, depends upon particular racialized narrations that frame some as others, confining them in spaces of difference, legally, culturally, politically, as I really show and go in the in deep analysis in my chapter on Jerusalem. Racialization in this case is an ongoing process reflected in structural relations of power that producing and maintaining the self and the other, be it in non-Jew, the non-Hindu, etc. Et and therefore what we do in our book 
is we try to trace the matrix of power that sacralization mobilizes. And when looking comparatively, we have seen that there are three main modes of sacralization that we're, we, we talk about. Of course, there are others. The first operates through managing the consciousness. It's about the effect on the mind, including construction of self-identity in relation to others. So managing consciousness and the construction of self-identity is very important because here we, here we refer to the construction of political and politically and ideologically motivated imagination. And that connects to what Professor Rohana was talking about. So it is that imagined, yeah? And it's embedded in religious claims to maintain the purity of the nation and its culture. And it's very gendered, by the way, yeah? It's religiously justified perception of chosenness. It's fulfilling in the world of the deity or using religious tests to legitimize political acts, even by secular agents. So it's not that what, what uh, Nono was saying, that we are only dealing with religious dynasty. No, also the secular because such processes engage communities and nations in dynamics that not only nationalize and rationalize and legitimize prejudiced ideologies and support the privilege of one group vis-a-vis -vis the other, but also rationalize constructing a collective self that internalize this supremacy and exclusivity at the minimum to justify the privilege yeah, of the sacred. So narrations of exclusivity founded on sacralized accounts function to produce, to affect patterns of acting, modes of thinking, and so on. So this can help explain how and why we use that concept of the looking at the way it's affecting the consciousness. And, and the, other, the other, the second point that we have looked at is through territoriality and territoriality and the politics of land, of course, that, or the sacralization of the land. You know, we just had the event last week and I talked about Silwan's case there. Yeah? In this regard, we really discern two related routes that characterize most cases in our uh, book of sacralized state territorial politics and that have evident consequences for instigating interstate and intrastate conflict, yeah? The first is claiming the right to undertake territorial expansion at the expense of other nations in the name of a religious text or tradition. The second with potent implication for intergroup relations within the state, whether ethnic, religious, racial, or lingual group, yeah, is endowing the land with some sort of sacredness. In the first route, states can seek territorial expansion. Uh, the case of Israel's expansion into the West Bank, the case of, that we see it is, is clear. The second route of territorial politics is sacralizing land. State employs such claims, not only for land seizure, and territorial expansion, but also for excluding fellow citizens, ethnically, nationally, a religious group on the ground that the land as being sacred for the privileged group based on religious scripture and so on. Now in my, in my and the third one is about governance using violence and necropolitical regime of control. And I won't go into it. Let me just take you to my chapter where in order to understand, because if the third point is the governmentality that is performing sacralized racialities operates through various forms of violence that are legitimized on the basis of religious claims and maintains a system of, of racialized control. When I look at, at my case, which is the case of occupied East Jerusalem, I, I really take the reader and I am talking to you from the old city. I really take the reader into the political work of the religious nationalist uh, modes of colonial governance. And I examine different issues. One of the issues I would like to show you is, is how that number one, the global regime of tolerance to the sacralization of politics contribute to, to racialization, yeah? These global forces are epitomized by Trump's administration's 
uh, unquestioning backing of Israel and his reiteration of Israeli religious claims over Jerusalem in his presidential announcement, proclaiming Jerusalem, and I quote, as the capital of the Jewish people established in ancient times, yeah? And I won't go into David Fridman's analysis and his reproduction of religious discourse so as to further the settler colonial project, yeah? And, and the other issue, I look at law, and I look at how, after all, we all know that colonialism was done legally, yeah? And in the case of Jerusalem, its sacralization is really biopolitically, geopolitically invoked. But one thing I would like to show our, our audience and to conclude my short intervention is the theatricality and aesthetic violence of sacralized politics during the, um, the parades or the, um, the parades, uh, okay. Um, Okay, and I will end with it just to show you. Nadira, we can't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. But we can see the subtitle, okay. so. <laughs> that what, what you have seen here is a clear uh, explanation of what sacralized politics is really theatrically, aesthetically, yeah, demonstrated, yeah. It draws the line of what is sacred and who is sacred and who is profane in correspondence with the settler colonial social formation that divide the people based on racialized discourse that determines who must be destroyed in order to be replaced, yeah? Uh, and I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, this is, um, thank you also for sharing uh, uh, this video because it really, this clip, because it really um, uh, exemplifies all the points that you made and also with respect to how, when we talk about um, this, um, when politics are sacralized, we're also talking about racialization. Uh, and that it's gendered uh, in such profound ways. Um, and so, uh, so when um, uh, one analyzes the, um, uh, the practices, the actual realities of Judaization, it's not only of, of the land with kind of presumptions of sac uh, sacredness, but also in the bodies. So it's very embodied and, um, uh, and, and very, uh, gendered. So, uh, so yeah, so I just want to uh, let me say one yeah, word. Yeah. What we have seen also, and what we have stressed in the book is that the, the sacralized politics is essential in the violent governance of the Palestinians, in, in our case, in the Palestinian body, in, in the Palestinian space, and in turn, the maintenance and reproduction of racialized Zionist politics. So this is where the, the uniqueness there, the power of using that frame of sacralized politics to look at how it is not only operated and governed, it's the way it's affecting the mind, the way it's translated territorially, the way it's translated politically, and how it marks the body as disposable, as evictable, as erasable. Yeah, um, uh, this is so profound. And of course, it connects to your work on the, um, the occupation of the census. Um, uh, so I, um, 
um, I, I really find it so um, so useful analytically and um, and otherwise to um, to go through those uh, three uh, points that you um, uh, highlighted of the managing of consciousness, the territoriality dimensions, and the governmentality, the necropolitics um, that, uh, that that you highlighted. Uh, so I'm aware that um, uh, I mean we have uh, quite a few questions, and I'm aware that we are um, running out of time. Um, so. Um, so I, um, I was, um, uh, so I'm just I'm trying to think of how um, maybe if each one of you can uh, reflect really briefly on um, uh, where do you think, where does the kind of the, the decolonial intervention comes in? Um, in so, so because what we've described is kind of the, um, uh, the, the, the realities, but there is also kind of a decolonial um, um, horizon uh, that frames the that frames the conversation. So Professor Raskar Potsin talk, talked about earlier about exile, um, and um, there are other kind of implications with respect to the question to the actual practices of resistance and that the political discourse of nationalism is emancipatory <laughs> um, from, um, uh, from from a pa Palestinian perspective. But also um, Professor Raskar Potsin, you talked about exile as potential space to even kind of decolonize the very uh, discourse of the nation of nationalism. So I want to just maybe invite each one of you to, to in respect to your analysis and to your engagement with the question of um, sacralized politics to, to, to reflect on what is the kind of the, what, what are the decolonial horizons. Um, so maybe we'll start uh, with you, um, no, no. Okay, I will, I, I, I will say a few words. I, don't, I of course cannot answer you simply. Uh, because it's a matter of practice, but when, in fact, exile emerged from two dimensions. First of all, because it, it's the, the denial of exile, the explicit denial of exile in the uh, in Zionist discourse, the explicit of exile has different dimensions. Uh, the, the denial of the exilic Jew considered as weak and oriental, uh, the but mainly the denial of this concept that the world is in exile, that the state of the Jews is exiled, uh, including in the land, which is crucial, uh, 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 is, the, is, is the core of practicing, uh, uh, of practices, uh, religious practices, and of uh, ways of thinking, including Jews who lived in Palestine. Uh, and the second dimension is, of course, that Zionism caused the exile of the Palestinians and the fact that exile is the main experience of Palestinians everywhere, whether on their land, whether uh, uh, under uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, domination and occupation. So how can we think about exile as a leading form of people for living together. I mean, I used to, go to say that uh, uh, the Israelis say the land belongs to us. But yes, secular Zionism, I used once said it, uh, God believed that God does not exist, but he promised the land to us. The land belongs to us. Palestinian used to say, they are the children of the land. They are the, a blind man. Have, and this is the, whole, the entire difference in terms of belonging and in terms of theology to think about living together. I mean, exile is the opposite of the logic of the nation state of belonging and consequently of excluding. So I wish to think about a way of practice, political demand for living together and when I think about the way of thinking about living together equally in a decolonial, decolonial uh, situation is through reflecting on uh, this notion, which indeed was developed by Jews, interestingly, in Palestine in the 16th century, mainly, as a cause. So, that's what, that's what I try to do, unfortunately, unsuccessfully in different ways, when the main goal is indeed how to change from the, pro the process of colonization of the Jews, of the land, 
and of course the Palestinians to this process of decolonization. And I'm not sure that I, I hope I was clear in one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nadim? I, I, I have two, two short comments. First, uh, uh, Khaled's chapter is in our volume, in a way, a major contribution to show the contrast of secularized politics, okay. how in the Palestinian case, as he really mentioned, convincingly, persuasively, it's a case of, uh, you know, when religion was used for, I mean, uh, was mobilizing for, for resistance. It's very important. We have another chapter for contrast, and that's the chapter on Ireland, where it takes a settler colonial approach by David Lloyd. So it's very important to put that in context. The context is to show the contrast. Number two, in terms of decolonization, I connect with uh, Nono. And I think the issue here is that if Zionism, secular or non-secular, as we said, has the religious legitimation and the settler colonial uh, supporting each other, for, for decolonization, you decolonize the settler colonial. Right, and in order to decolonize the settler colonial, you have you cannot do it within Zionism because it has the religious legitimation and because it considers the land as exclusive land of the Jewish people, secular or no secular. Secular Zionism is the same in this regard. It's the exclusive land of the Jewish people. How do you make it a common homeland, right? And that's the question. My only conclusion is that within Zionism, it has to be said openly, frankly, loudly. Within Zionism, that is undoable. We have to look for other ways mm -hmm. for which uh, we, we will be, we will be uh, uh, talking about a common homeland and living together. And um, you know, yeah. the, the floor there is open. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, which is uh, exactly that last point about how uh, you just cannot have that conversation within the framework of, of Judaism is exactly the argument that Judith Butler is making in her book, uh, Parting Ways. You cannot have um, a, a, a discourse about um, um, a, a justice discourse within Palestine, Israel, um, in, uh, within, kind of, uh, within a Zionist framework, and you cannot privilege um, uh, Jewish sources, like only look at the Jewish sources in order to think of ways of cohabitation, because that you know, we established the, um, uh, the primacy, kind of the privilege. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, what we can see is kind of convergences of all those conversations, which is very, uh, very int interesting, and I think also generative. Um, uh, Hala, do you want to um, just kind of reflect on whatever is on the table? You don't have to uh, stick to any of the threads that were just discussed. You are muted. You are muted. <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, I don't have much to add, but maybe kind of one comes to one idea that, that comes to my mind about the talk about decolonization and the, the decolonization of maybe knowledge, uh, discourse, and media, and this and that. Um, it's kind of very, uh, very telling that is up until this very moment when it comes to to deal with the Palestinian case from a Western perspective, not all of them, of course, but at least you know, the official approach, you know, um, you still have, you know, the, the traces and trails of Orientalism, classical Orientalism, that is, you know, the Palestinians are just part of the Orient, part of the Middle East, where you have the dominant forces are kind of the social, traditional, religious, tribal, the, 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 the rest of it. So the Palestinians, of course, I mean, they, they just, they, the only thing that they have is religion to resort to. Um, and this is a religious, a religious society with religious politics, with, the, with so on and so forth. So that is the image. That is the image that I myself face, you know, whatever I go in, in Europe or here and there conferences and seminars. But you, they have, you have the least effort exerted just kind of to know the details, to deconstruct you know, the, the picture. And for me to see exactly the opposite. That is in fact, what you think of as a liberal democratic state that is Israel, the production of Zionism. <clears throat> in fact, you have, you have a racist production, you have an apartheid regime, 
and you have a very religiously driven community. So you just, you don't want to see this. And the, the connection colonial is still, the, is, is still there. That is, this is the extension of, um, uh, of the European uh, civilization as Herzl advocated and, and when he was kind of trying to convince European uh, politicians in Nero. Yet at the same time, the Palestinian national movement, nationalist movement is, is since almost day one, uh, and for me, because in part, because of the legacy of the anti-Ottoman movements, because they wanted to, to break away from the Ottomans, they wanted decentralization. So the whole idea of citizenship, the whole idea of having national entity, uh, it was somehow kind of maturing even before the conflict with Zionism. So you had these ideas, in fact, for a different agenda. And they continued to mature until this very moment. And yet they are hijacked, all of them, and reduced to this image that is, you know, Hamas. Palestine, the Palestinians is Hamas. And so. so it's kind of somehow um, uh, very frustrating. <laughs> that is, until this very moment, we still have this kind of reductionist discourse and approach. Thank you. I yeah, know I'm so glad that you brought um, into our conversation explicitly um, the uh, enduring hold of Orientalism. Of course, it connects to the whole analysis of uh, let's, cent let's think through where is Christian Europe modernity, uh, where does it participate in the very realities that um, um, that we are gra grappling with now, and with respect to the sacralization of, of um, uh, when politics are sacralized. So thank you so much for for um, underscoring this point. Um, and uh, finally, Nadira, <laughs> your reactions, reflections, final points. I think that. Uh... It was said, but maybe I should say one thing that comes from uh, the different chapters, you know, Lloyd's from North, uh, that Northern Ireland and uh, Lloyd uh, talked really took us to a more, to unpack the racialization. But I also want to, to stress, especially Tanika Sarkar's chapter where the issue of, of, of you know, decoloniality in, in, in different cases are important in, in some of the cases, but it's beyond. It is about unpacking the matrix of power, but it's beyond uh, unpacking the matrix of power. As a feminist, I would tell you that the everydayness is important in, in looking and in thinking. And if you were talking about Edward Said uh, and about Oriental, you know, it was the permission to narrate. And here, who has the permission to narrate? Do the Kashmiris in, in, in India, can they narrate? Would they be heard or, or in, in Sri Lanka, uh, the other groups? So the question is how, who has the right to narrate? What about the details? What about the everydayness? In Zionism, here we see a necro, a capitalist, a game. It's about the economy of life and death. It's about constant debilitation. It differs than other settler colonial contexts. There is no politics of saving or, or caring. It's really about a, a necropolitical. It's about uh, who, who has the right to live and who should be evicted. His house should be demolished, her house should be, and so on. So there is a constant production of precarity. Therefore, I would say it's anti-colonialist. It should be not decoloniality, but anti-colonial action, resistance, for self-determination, for the acknowledgement of the right of the native in order to move on. There is no other way. You cannot keep that sacralized politics in the middle and then tell the indigenous, the community that is being debilitated and that their precarity is being reproduced uh, not, to, not to react. So I guess that that connects the different um, layers to, to me, at least in my own perceptions towards how can we unpack sacralizations with anti-coloniality in our condition. Yeah, I think that's such a profound way to conclude this conversation. It's, um, uh, first of all, like I'm, I'm just going to reflect back uh, kind of the, the points that you made, uh, one about by looking at um, uh, both you and Nadine just now in that this round, looking at the, uh, the other chapters, what they also contribute uh, uh, is the, to de-exceptionalize um, kind of the kind of um, uh, analytic frames or any kind of other 
forms of justification or understanding or explanation of what is happening in Palestine, Israel, um, it de-exceptionalizes, de brings that, those broader narr uh, narratives and, and conceptual frames like settler colonialism and so forth. Uh, but also the point about um, again, going back to Said and uh, Orientalism, but also with respect to Palestine, Israel, that notion of the permission to narrate it. So uh, it's so profound and so important. Um, and, um, and, 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 and I, th I think it's so uh, uh, the point about this uh, reproduction of precarity and the necropolitics that is one of the three dimensions that you highlighted, Nadira, in your uh, explication. Uh, really takes us to that to that you know, that space of resistance and the anti-colonial. And now the question is, well, how do we think about um, political emancipation or other forms of anti uh, emancipation within that framework? What what language? What um, uh, what vocabulary and idioms do we use? Do we use nationalism? Uh, do you use secular nationalism uh, in thinking about uh, kind of the emancipatory horizon? So I'll, I'll just maybe leave it at that because uh, mm -hmm. this is one of the questions that is uh, provoked for me in terms of thinking about resistance and the anti-colonial stance. Once we have the analysis in going back to um, Nono's point about we're not talking about religion, we're talking about colonialism. Um, uh, so I think maybe this is a good place to end, which is not an end. <laughs> yeah, it opens um, uh, uh, the conversation and the, I'm, I'm so thankful for this book, for the, um, the editorial framing uh, and the contributions. Uh, I think it's, it's so profoundly generative. I'm already assigning it in my classes, um, and um, it was uh, such, a, such an honor to have you all here um, in this conversation, and I just hope to, uh, to continue it. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to the audience. Sponsor, Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. Copyright 2021, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.